fervent. The nothing personal word of the day today, Monday, September 21st, is fervent, which means having or displaying a passionate intensity. Fervent is the word of the day because Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the Supreme Court Justice who passed away this weekend, had a wish and her, she said, my most fervent wish is that I will not be replaced until a new president is installed. We're gonna get to a little bit about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and what's gonna happen next in the Supreme Court. This is, I'm a sports guy, you know that, but there's a lot more that I'm interested in and there's a lot more to talk about today. The Supreme Court of the United States has an opening. There are nine justices, now there's only eight. Five are conservative, three are liberal. That said, there are occasions when conservative justices rule and join the liberal side, and there are times when the liberal justices join the conservative side. The Chief Justice Roberts has actually joined the liberal side on a couple of opinions this year. It is a big opening in the Supreme Court, a gaping hole. And it went right to politics this weekend, and it was very upsetting to me. When someone dies like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when anyone dies, it doesn't have to be Ruth Bader Ginsburg, it can be a family member, it can be a friend. Before you start talking about what's next, I get in sports when someone gets hurt, that's what you cry from the mountaintop. Next man up. We're so sorry that our star player's out for the year. Having Tommy John surgery, someone's taking the ball. Next man up. That's very much a sports philosophy, though it is used often in non-sports context. The king is dead. Long live the king. Who knows that expression? What that means is, yeah, our king died. It sucks. But long live the king, meaning next king up, let's go. I get it, but I think it's important for people to understand Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the woman, the justice, the lawyer. She had a life that was absolutely incredible. She lost her battle with cancer. But I just want to talk for a few minutes about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and point out a few things that we will be talking about for centuries. This is the type of justice. I went to a law school called Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law. Who's that? A Supreme Court justice. Ruth Bader Ginsburg will have law schools named after her before it is all said and done. It's not easy being a woman ever. It's certainly not easy being a woman when you are one of only nine at Harvard Law School. She went to Cornell undergrad. The only job she could get might I add, she was a typist. It's the only job that as a woman she could get. She then got pregnant, believe it or not, and lost her job. When you talk about moments that inform your life, we all have baggage, we all have memories, we all have things that happen when we were children. Some of them are real, some of them are not real, some of them we make up. It's those seminal moments when you think to yourself, I have now found my calling. Some people can wait a decade, two decades. They can be 40, 50. Some people are octogenarians before they find their purpose. Ruth Bader Ginsburg found her purpose early on. She wanted to fight for gender equality. So she goes to Harvard Law School. She becomes a lawyer, but she doesn't graduate from Harvard. She moves with her husband. She was married with kids to New York finishes top of her class, finishes up at Columbia Law School. Remember we had Jonathan Holloway on the call. Jonathan Holloway uh, did a Samson sit down with us, president of Rutgers University. Ruth Bader Ginsburg actually taught at Rutgers Law School. And when you're a teacher in law school, you also are a practicing lawyer. I learned under some great practicing attorneys at Cardozo, including Barry Sheck, who you may remember from the OJ Simpson case, but he's done a lot more than that. He has something called the Innocence Project, helps people get free for DNA when it's not them, when they're not guilty. 
So she's teaching at Rutgers Law School and she starts taking on cases and she wants to take on gender discrimination cases. Now, people are going to say that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was all about women's equality. And if you know and study Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you'll know that that's actually not true. What she fought against was general gender discrimination. For example, one of her most famous cases was representing a man who wanted to take a tax deduction for caring for his elderly parent. But the law was that only women could take tax deductions for care of the elderly. And he said, I'm caring for the elderly. I want the tax deduction. She represented the man. She won. She argued in front of the Supreme Court, including in 1971, she represented a woman who just wanted to be the executor of her dead son's estate. An executor is someone who's in charge of taking care of, after someone dies, taking care of the distribution of that person's assets, finishing that person's life while that person is dead. It's called the executor of an estate. She was a divorcee. Her ex-husband wanted to be the executor and the state law said that preference would be given to the man every time. So she sued in a lawsuit that was called actually Reed versus Reed. Sounds like Kramer versus Kramer. It wasn't for divorce. It was for the right to be the executor of an estate. And the case was, can a state, so the Supreme Court hears cases and they interpret state law. And the question asked in Reed versus Reed, can the state actually prefer men over women? Think about that concept. How could it be that you could have a law in the books where by definition, men are preferred over women? It makes no sense. Unanimous. She wrote the majority opinion, all the men on the bench, who at the time it was all men, agreed. That was the first ever state law that was struck down because of gender discrimination. She spent her life fighting, fighting for gender equality. She then became a judge. She was appointed, the way you become a Supreme Court justice generally is you are taken from the Court of Appeals. Most often, there are exceptions. Jimmy Carter in 1980 named her to the Court of Appeals. And in 1993, Bill Clinton nominated her to be a Supreme Court justice. Now, presidents do not do anything other than nominate someone to be a justice of the Supreme Court. It is then up to the 100 senators to confirm that nomination. To confirm a nomination, you need a majority, 51 out of 100 senators. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, nominated by a Democratic president, received 96 votes when she was confirmed in 1993. 96 votes. With partisanship now, you're lucky if you get 51. She spent 27 years on the bench, and we spend a lot of time talking about partisanship in this world. Democrats don't like conservatives. Conservatives don't like Democrats. People, it's like preaching to the choir when you try to convince someone of something these days, because generally what you believe is what you believe and your mouth moves and your ears close. Well, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, her ears were always open. Her best friend on the Supreme Court was a fellow justice named Antonin Scalia, an unbelievable conservative, represented everything that Ruth Bader Ginsburg held in contempt. Everything that she believed Scalia held in contempt. They had completely opposite views and do you know what? They were best friends. They respected each other's views even if they didn't agree. They listened to each other's arguments even if they weren't at the end of the day persuasive. In our society, which has lost all of its finesse, isn't it interesting that on the Supreme Court of the United States, there were two people completely opposite in every way. Scalia was this big man's man. He died in 2016. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was this tiny little woman. Totally opposite views. And they got along completely and utterly to the core. If you want to learn more about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I think, Coco, we reviewed the RBG documentary. 
back in early days of nothing personal. I could be wrong, but I think we did. There's a documentary, not the movie on the basis of sex, which is a fine movie about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her life fighting for gender equality. The documentary with Ruth Bader Ginsburg is well worth your time. What's gonna happen now is the president is gonna nominate someone to the Supreme Court and the question that everyone is asking is, will the Senate bring this nominee to a vote? In order for the Senate to bring someone to a vote to be confirmed, they have to have a quorum. That means there needs to be 51 senators who show up in the chamber. Then they, the Senate majority leader can hold a vote. And then you need 51 yeses for the Supreme Court justice to be nominated. Coke is telling me we never reviewed RBG. I don't know why that is disappointing. It is a phenomenal documentary. You are gonna be reading a lot, maybe not on the sports page, but on every other page in the paper, on every channel, whether it's Fox or CNN, you are gonna be reading a lot about this nominee. As you recall, in Obama's last year, there was an opening in the Supreme Court when Scalia passed away, ironically and the Republicans would not bring a nominee to the floor who is Obama's choice. The Republicans said, we will not bring someone to the floor. It's totally their right. Now they want to bring someone to the floor and people are saying it's inconsistent. The Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is saying it's not inconsistent because we've got a Republican Senate and a Republican in the White House. Back then it was a Republican Senate and a Democrat in the White House. Whatever your view is, I'm not gonna tell you what to think. I'm not gonna tell you that leaders need to be consistent. What I'm gonna tell you is there's gonna be a fight. And the worst part about this fight is that when the history books talk about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, it'll be three paragraphs about her life and three pages about the fight to replace her. And the reality is it should be three pages about her life and three paragraphs about the fight to replace her. May she rest in peace and may all of us find a way to make even one one hundredth of a difference during our lifetimes that Ruth Bader Ginsburg made in her lifetime. Okay, the show goes on, on the field and off the field. We had one hell of an NFL week two. Cowboys with their comeback, that was crazy. Did you see the onside kick? If you didn't, you should check it out. The Cowboys needed to recover an onside kick. It's impossible to recover onside kicks these days. They come back from down like 20 points at the half, whatever the score was. It may have been like 28-10 at the half, or maybe I'm thinking about the 28-3 Patriots Super Bowl victory when they were down to the Falcons, because that was in my head this weekend. Anyway, they needed a onside kick, and by the way, to get an onside kick, you need to get lucky because it just doesn't work. For whatever reason, the Falcons screwed up the onside kick. Dan Quinn, a little late for my wait to see when I thought he wouldn't even survive the offseason. I lost that wait to see. Somehow the Falcons did not recover it. The Cowboys did kick the field goal. They won 40 to 39. Not the story of the weekend. Jets getting crushed. Adam Gase's job in jeopardy. Nope. Not the story of the weekend. The NFC West, nine and one as a division. Three two and O's and a one and one. That would be seven and one. Coca, do I have the math right? Is it two O, two O, two O and one one? Or are there four two O's and a one one? I think there's three two O's and a one one, which will only be seven and one. If there's four two O's, it'd be a nine and one. Is that the story? What a dominant division that is? Nope. That seven and one was not the story. The story for all of you people playing fantasy, the story for all of you people gambling on games, not on fantasy, is that you better have a deep bench. I hate being right when it comes to this. Coke and I spent so much time talking about the reality of the NFL season. Coke actually told me before the show today that he was offered to be in a fantasy league, this hugely expensive fantasy league. And he didn't want to do it because he was so positive, having talked through it on the show, that the injuries were going to be out of control this season. 
And we said without preseason, there was a major problem. Well, it took all of two weeks. Every time you looked up, there was a game-changing injury. Did it make any bad teams worse? That's not as big a story as making a great team good. Saquon Barkley, the Giants' number two pick, the player who they plan to build around, missed time last year with a high ankle sprain. This year, he goes out yesterday, likely a torn ACL out for the whole season. If you're running that team and you're the Giants, you are despondent beyond repair because he was your only hope. Certainly not gonna be Daniel Jones. Maybe they're trying to get Trevor Lawrence. The reality is that that's a bad team that's now worse. How about the San Francisco 49ers? Super Bowl team last year. Can you name, <clears throat> I did this exercise this weekend preparing for the show. Going backwards, remembering Super Bowl winners. I remember the Chiefs won, couldn't remember who they beat. The Niners. The Niners were the NFC champions. I then remember they'd beaten the Packers in the NFC championship. Unbelievable defense. What happens? One of their top defensive players, top defensive players named Nick Bosa. We've actually mentioned him on the show, I think. Hurt his leg out. Don't worry, we've got an offense. Garoppolo is their quarterback. Out with an ankle. This is a team that was tied with the second best odds to win the Super Bowl. This is a great team that with these injuries may only be good. Was this because there was no preseason? That's my view. The coach of the Niners disagrees wholeheartedly. His name is Kyle Shanahan. Remember his father was a coach named Mike Shanahan, who coached the Broncos and the Raiders, I believe, at least. It's amazing as I get older, how many sons of coaches are now coaches or sons of referees are now referees. James Capers is an NBA conference finals referee. I was there when his dad was refing games. So Kyle Shanahan, big time coach, was playing a team called the New Jersey Jets who stink. They're the New York Jets, sorry. Why do I call them? They play in Jersey. That's funny. Kyle Shanahan took the microphone after the game and lost his mind. You know, MetLife Stadium has turf. It's the new thing now. They're doing it in baseball. The Marlins just put turf in. It's not like the old days of AstroTurf, like at the old Olympic Stadium in Montreal, where knees went to break. If you ask Andre Dawson, the Hall of Fame baseball player who played in Montreal, what cost you your career? He's a Hall of Famer. The answer is nothing. What hurt you the most, causing you to replace your knees when you got older? He'd take one second and say the turf in Montreal. It's like playing on cement. I actually played a game on the turf in Montreal. Brought a bunch of friends up in 2000 or 2001, and we played after one of our games. It was insane how sorry we were, forgetting the fact that we were old. Just playing one game, and it was a seven-inning game, like a game one of a doubleheader. Kyle Shanahan called out the turf, the current turf, with all of the technological improvements, called it out and said, it's trash. It's sticky. The problem with sticky turf is if you have the wrong cleats and you're not wearing the right turf cleats, that's redundant, and your foot sticks and you plant and move, except your foot doesn't move after you plant, goodbye ankle, goodbye knee, goodbye leg. Have you ever gone skiing and you're in a ski boot and you fall and you don't release from your ski binding? You break your leg. That's why you have to release. Do you ever water ski and you fall and your ski comes off and you have to swim after it? Thank God, or you'd break your leg. If you plant on turf and don't move, you are screwed. 
Don't worry, though. The Niners aren't alone. How about Christian McCaffrey? Ever heard of Christian McCaffrey? The guy who had 1,000 yards rushing and 1,000 yards receiving last year? Do you know how many players have done that in history? Three. Roger Craig, who played for the Niners back in the day. Marshall Falk, played for the Rams back in the day. 1,000 yards rushing, 1,000 yards receiving. Number one pick in every fantasy draft. Gone. See you later. Multiple weeks. Now, in a baseball season, you say, ah, oh, you're missing a few weeks, whatever. In a football season, that could be 25% of the year if you miss four games. Teams could take advantage of that. Maybe the Broncos are poised to take advantage even though they can't win a game. Nope, their quarterback, shoulder injury, two to six weeks for Drew Locke after they lost Von Miller. The list is a who's who from David Montgomery to the rookie wide receiver, Jerry Judy, Devontae Adams, Byron Jones. I'm not here to list the injured list. I'm here to say that the NFL has this problem and it's not called COVID. The problem is that with no preseason games, you are in a position where you are putting your players in jeopardy. We're not talking about concussions, which can come no matter what. I'm not saying it's the turf. I'm saying that these players are getting hurt because they were not game ready, even though it's just week two. We are seeing a rash of injuries these first two weeks that is inexplicable for any other reason other than what was different. Training camp was the same amount of time. They were in shape. The difference is they did not get to hit anyone who wasn't a member of their own locker room. And then you go to full speed immediately. It's hard to do. I'm going to give you a wait to see early in the show. Wait to see is when we tell you we think something's going to happen. And if it does, we're going to follow up and tell you it did. If it doesn't, we'll follow up and tell you that we were wrong. Wait to see is this is a long-term one. I've got a few short-term ones to talk about. I like the long-term ones because you'll think I'll forget, but I keep track and I'll remember either way, I promise. In 2021, while the owners may not like it and the players don't want to do it, there will be a minimum of two preseason games. The reason why I think that is that the owners are realizing that paying players not to play is not helpful to them winning games. The players are going to realize that in a league where contracts are not guaranteed, being hurt is the single worst thing you can have happen to you as a football player. In baseball, you're hurt. Who cares? Guaranteed. Football, not so much. There will be a minimum of two preseason games starting next season. Remember, we tell you about Wait to See back on February 11th. Back before COVID. We told you the Red Sox would not make the playoffs. Guess what? We got that right. The Red Sox were eliminated from the playoffs, even the expanded playoffs. I didn't deserve to win that way to see. Three, 13 days later, I gave you a way to see on February 24th that Dustin Pedroia will not play another inning in Major League Baseball. Anyone seen Dustin Pedroia? I'm taking the yes on that one. But then on March 6th, I had a problem. Do you remember on March 6th, it was the Lakers against the Bucks. This is pre-COVID. It was in China, but we didn't think it would infect us. There were five people sick and they were all getting better. Everything was going to be A-OK. -okay. Lakers were playing the Bucks. These were the two best teams in basketball. Giannis, LeBron, uh, nothing personal on that day. I said, whoever wins that game, that player will be the MVP of the league. The Lakers won that game 113-103, which means LeBron, for me to win the way to see, would be the MVP. Well, this weekend, Giannis won the MVP after he won Defensive Player of the Year, by the way. That's how good Giannis is. That's how amazing it is what the Heat did to the Bucks in the bubble. That way to see was a loser. 
How about a recent one? On August 11th, I think this must have been after the Ivy Leagues and after the Big 14 canceled fall football. I gave you a way to see that the SEC will follow suit. I said the SEC will cancel football in the fall. Boy, was I wrong. That's a straight no on the wait to see. Well, NFL week two, that's your update. It's injuries, it's injuries, it's injuries. When we come back, I get to say shit a lot. Welcome back. Anyone up late watching the Emmys last night? I was. You know, my favorite drama is Succession, and it crushed last night. Best actor, best directing, best writing, <clears throat> best drama. You know my favorite comedy in my top 10 of all-time favorite shows. I can't remember what number it is. I did it in an end-of-month mailbag pod. By the way, we will do another end-of-month mailbag pod at the end of September. Please review us on Apple. Rate us five stars. Go on to Apple. And then ask a question in the review. And at the end of the month, I do a mailbag pod where I answer all your questions. Please do that. They're fun. Someone asked me for my top 10 series. Schitt's Creek is one of them. Last night were the Emmys, and I loved watching it. I really did. The reason I love the Emmys, it was the first award show, and I love award show, I admit it, that was post-pandemic. There was no one in the stands. No red carpet. No best dress. No worst dressed. All the stars were at home. Jimmy Kimmel was the host from the Staples Center. It was phenomenal. There were a few bits that I didn't like, a few bits that landed, but the real takeaway from the Emmys was that Shit's Creek swept in a way that no show, be ready for this. This is a little show from Canada with Eugene Levy and his son, Dan Levy. Catherine O'Hara. No show in the history of television comedy. Not one. Not MASH, not Seinfeld, not Cheers. Not one has swept the four acting awards the way Schitt's Creek did. Best Actor, Best Actress, Best Supporting Actor, Best Supporting Actress. And it won Best Series, Best Directing, Best Writing. If you have not watched Schitt's Creek yet, Start. The first five seasons are on Netflix. The final season drops in October. If you have Pop TV, you can watch them all right now. Dan Levy took to the microphone so many times in a row that he apologized. He was embarrassed by his riches. So deserving. There had been no Emmy love for Schitt's Creek until this year, and boy, did they make up for it. An abundance of Emmy love for Schitt's Creek. And I'm thankful for it. Overall, it's an award show. There's a lot of good content out there, folks. What about if you're a network? Viacom CBS did well. But did they do well from network TV or because of their cable situation with Showtime? Netflix, Amazon. Where was... ABC, CBS, NBC as networks. The way TV has changed, you either are on the program or you've missed the boat. I had missed the boat and I put on my PFD and I started swimming for my dear life and I found the boat and I got in the boat. If you're not watching these streaming channels and the content that they're delivering, you are missing a level of quality that has never been available before. And it is showing with the Emmys. Check out Succession. Check out Schitt's Creek. That's the Emmys. Time for our MLB weekend update. By the way, that was my review. I, got, I forgot to mention one thing, Coca. So the thing about being on Sirius XM as an example, when Howard Stern went from terrestrial radio to satellite radio, he could say bad words and he could be graphic and gross. When you do a pod, you can say bad words. They put explicit on it, but you can say bad words. When you're on cable, 
You can show nudity. You can say bad words. I say bad words. You can say swear words. But if you're on the regular networks, you're not allowed to say shit. I don't know when people are going to wake up and realize that the networks are being left behind. Last night, and I cannot find out whether this was a joke or whether this was real. So if anyone has this information, please give it to me. Jimmy Kimmel, the host, said that the censors for ABC said that any time they say shit, as in Shit's Creek, they've got to put the logo of the show on your screen so that everyone is clear that when you say Shit's Creek, you're talking about the show. And the show was mentioned so many times because it won so often that every time it was mentioned, you saw their show title. But every time you heard Succession or any other show, you didn't see their show logo. So either ABC kept the joke going all night or it was real. Is that even possible? It better not be. Okay, weekend update time. Ooh, that'd be a cool segment. I think Saturday Night Live should do like a weekend update where they give an update as to what's going on. We do it with the NFL and we get to do it with MLB for a little while longer. You know we've got playoffs starting September 29th, eight days from today. The race in the National League is outstanding. There's like five teams within a game and a half. The Marlins are the fifth seed right now, which is unreal. Three games over 500. But there are teams a game under 500, three games under 500. So they're a game and a half away from missing the playoffs altogether. It's funny, the Marlins, by the way, I was thinking about this today. When we were flying to Chicago in 2003, we were down three games to two. And we told everyone for the second time that postseason, pack a big suitcase because we're going from Chicago onto the World Series. When we went to San Francisco, that's not even worth talking about. What I want to say is that the Marlins are now on the road playing in Atlanta for four games, playing in New York for three games. When they make the playoffs, they may have to go to San Diego to play for three games. Once you beat them, you're going to Texas for the bubble. If I'm running the Marlins, I'm putting a note right up there in the clubhouse. This road trip will last a month and a half. Bring a change of undies, folks. We're giving you a big suitcase because we're flying to Atlanta and we're not coming home until we come home from Texas with the trophy. Three teams. The Reds are 27 and 27. The Brewers are 26 and 26. The Giants are 26 and 26. The Phillies are 27 and 26 trying to catch the Marlins who are three games over in second place. Remember the top two teams in every division make the playoffs. It's going to be a wild final week. Don't bother watching the American League. I am not giving you an American League update. And the reason I'm not is that what we prayed for with expanded playoffs hasn't happened. There's no thing that is exciting. No thing. Nothing exciting in the American League at all. Now, I'm going to say I don't agree with you because I hear what you're saying in the studio audience. The Astros are in second place, but they're only holding off the Angels and the Mariners by a few games. If the, if the Astros lose every one of their remaining games, then maybe the Mariners or the Angels could make the playoffs. Hold on. I'm looking out the window at a thunderstorm. Yes, there it is. It's the cow jumping over the moon. The Astros will finish in second place and will make the playoffs. And the game one starter will be Justin Verlander. Because Justin Verlander said, I'll be back. I'm not hurt. Dusty Baker said he'll be back. The only people who knew, the only people who knew that Justin Verlander was done for the year 
where the people who watch CBS Sports HQ or listen and watch nothing personal. Justin Verlander got hurt. I believe it was called something called Coca. Let's say it on three. Justin Verlander's injury. One, two, three. Flexor strain. In my career, every flexor strain leads to Tommy John. I was on camera saying that Verlander was going to have Tommy John. And the higher ups at CBS were angry because Verlander himself said that he's going to pitch this year. Verlander got angry that there was any report that he was out for the year. Totally contradicted my report, which was not a report. I'm not a source guy. I was merely telling you, the listeners and the audience, that Verlander would not be able to come back. Hard stop. Of course, I was waiting to be proven wrong. I want him back. I want him pitching. It's a better league when he's pitching. He started throwing off a mound, giving updates. He's throwing simulated innings, games. Everyone's getting excited. And all I kept saying to Coca, it's a Fagazi. There's no chance he pitches in a major league game this year. Sure enough, on Kate Upton's Instagram, I'm kidding, it wasn't Kate Upton's Instagram, it was his own Instagram. Justin Verlander announced this weekend that he will be having dun dun dun, dun Tommy John surgery. Really? Shocker. What's shocking is what a blow it is to Houston. They owe Justin Verlander 33 big ones next year. He's now having Tommy John in September. In a best case scenario, he'll be back in 10 months. Not going to happen. It's 12 months. And even then, you're not really back to being you if you're back at all. And when you're of his advanced age, believe me, He's almost two score. He's a, almost a score younger than I am. So he's not old in real life, but in the baseball world, he's old. He may never come back. Still a Hall of Famer, one of the best ever. But Verlander's injury is crushing to Houston. This week, and also saw some droughts come to an end. I can't wait for the Marlins drought to come to an end. We haven't made the playoffs since 03. They, dollar, coca. The Padres had not made the playoffs since 2006. Perpetual rebuild. You know, if you're a loyal, nothing personal listener, that for me, A.J. Preller, the GM of the Padres, is the single worst GM in all of baseball. You know that their owner, Ron Fowler, said it's win or bust because heads will roll. And I said, well, what did that mean? Well, the Padres have had a great season, 60 games worth, and they have ended their playoff drought. They will make the playoffs as a number two seed, number two second place in the West behind the Dodgers. How about Jerry Reinsdorf and the White Sox? They clinched a playoff spot. All those young players complemented with the veteran signs like Asmani Grandal and Edwin Encarnacion and Dallas Keuchel and Gio Gonzalez. The White Sox clinched a playoff spot, but they're not done. Are they going to keep playing this week to win more games? Interestingly enough, the White Sox only have right now a two-game lead on the Twins with eight to play, let's say. The Twins want to catch the White Sox more than anything in the world. Because if they do, they don't have to play the Yankees. And we know what happens when the Twins play the Yankees in the playoffs. Remember the Yankees who had lost a bunch in a row and they were going to miss the playoffs? Uh, Yeah, no. They clinched the playoffs this weekend as well. The Twins are going to play to catch the White Sox. Will they? I don't know. But what's exciting to me is that as we watch this final week happen and we enter into what is my favorite month of the year of October, MLB has gotten the COVID under control. The players are actually paying attention. 
they are behaving. And we are going to have postseason in a bubble. We are going to get all the way through the World Series. And the Nationals, my preseason pick to win, are still my pick. The Nationals will prevail in the World Series this October. What? I think it's the single worst ever pick. Ever. Why am I even talking about the Nationals? Why do you think? Because I'm 19 and 12. Nothing personal pick of the day. 19 and 12. Tonight, we go for our 20th win, and we're going on Zach Wheeler's back, pitching against Anibal Sanchez of the Washington Nationals. The Washington Nationals, who started this season 19 and 31. Sound familiar? They started last season 19 and 31, and then won the World Series. This year, they started 19 and 31, and they're going to be home because it's a 60-game season. Does that mean that they will always look back and say what could have been? Yes. Does it mean they had to have started off hot and we said it before the season started? You cannot start slowly and expect to recover. You don't have the time that 162 games affords you. And the Nationals were in a position after a World Series, and I totally get it. They had to bring back players that if they had not had as good a season, they would not have brought back. Annabelle Sanchez is a great example. I love him. Pitch for us in Miami. Has a no-hitter for the Marlins. He has not been able to get anybody out this year. Unfortunately, I would say he's done, but he had a great career. Zach Wheeler, big free agent signing by the Phillies. They will win, and we will go to 20. Why do we have a chance to go to 20? Because we won our 19th. Not on Thursday. We won it on Wednesday. What happened on Thursday? I had the Celtics minus two and a half in a game two. And the Heat beat them. Why is that worth mentioning? Because the Celtics were down 2-0. The Heat were in a position. They were 10-1 and in the playoffs. The Celtics lost their mind. Literally lost their mind after losing the second game. After having a double-digit lead. I was positive I was going to win that pick last Thursday night. Instead, the Celtics crapped the bed. And then it got interesting. Their clubhouse became a firestorm of arguing and yelling and screaming and throwing stuff. I love it. We want the players to go crazy when the team doesn't play well. We would, we would say, turn over the spread was the expression in baseball. It's time for someone to turn over the spread. The spread in the old days is when the food would be out on a platter. In the COVID days, it's given you in a paper bag and plastic. But it would be spread out on a buffet table. A player would walk in and rip up the table. That's called turning over the spread to show some fire. Well, the Celtics had plenty of fire. They were fighting amongst themselves, blaming each other for their lack of sense of urgency. And I loved it. And you know who else loved it? Brad Stevens. Brad Stevens, the coach of the Celtics, did what only an experienced coach can do. He let them argue. He let it play out, and then instead of holding a team meeting that night, he waited a few hours, more than my 30-minute rule, and then he called in the leaders of the Celtics, your team captains, called them in and said, okay, boys, here's how it's going to be. You had your fun in the clubhouse. You made your point. When we go out for game three, You better be a unified team or we're going to be home in three days. Brad Stevens showed his medal as coach, as one of the best coaches in the NBA, by handling that game two loss and then subsequent argument in the perfect way. And how did the Celtics react? By crushing the Heat in game three. It wasn't even as close as the final score, 117-106. We got ourselves a series. Nothing personal pick of the day. Please go for the Phillies. NBA may return tomorrow. And we end the show with a correction. You know how we correct? When we're wrong on a wait to see, that's just something that's proven wrong. But when I do 45 minutes for you every day, I'm going to say things that are wrong. 
and that's okay. Give me the correction, I'll admit it. If I give you a point of view, and opinions are never wrong, but if I give you a fact and I'm told it's wrong, someone corrected me. I got the wrong number of NFL playoff teams, and someone immediately contacted at David P. Sampson on Twitter and said, this is the fact. This year, there are 14 playoff teams, not 12. There's an extra wild card team this year, so seven teams per conference. Expanded playoffs are all the rage in all the sports, COVID or no COVID. How come? Come on, say it with me. One, de trace, because it's business. This is nothing personal.